these amazing experiences with contact, some in relation to Betty Hill. You know, what can you tell us about that? Well, my brother moved uh, up there, moved in with Betty Hill, and he stayed with her for about eight years. And they had a lot of interesting, I don't know what you call them, contacts, you know, first-hand stuff, but my brother would tell me some things, and it was amazing, the details that were involved. And he mentioned one place, it, I take it it's, it's like a city, but it's, I don't know if it's on a different planet or a different time period or on a different planet in a different time period. Confusing, but uh, I remember some of the detail, the name of the place, he called, uh, it was Padia, I think it's P-E-D-I-A. I've never heard that word before. You know how we know Pleiadians, it's very similar to that, but it's Padians. Pleiadians. Yeah, and it's, that's their world and where they're from. What do they look like? The description of the people he gave, you know, I think, okay, I, I got this down. I couldn't imagine what it looked. Man, it was nothing I was expecting. He said their crafts are filled like aquariums. So they float. I said, well, do they lock in seats or chairs? You know, when they're flying, he said, no need to. He said, uh, their inertia dampeners filters through the water. And I'm going, that actually makes sense. Makes sense. And I said, um, well, do, what? Are they fish? No. You know, air breathing? Yeah. And I said, but they, they're in a constant liquid environment. And yeah. Amphibian. Yeah, they got gills under their jaw lines. And he said they breathe through that. It's right below their ears, recess back on the neck. I went, well, that makes sense too. Also, their eyes, uh, he said, they have some kind of coating or jealous, jelly like substance over their eyes. Well, that would make sense so they see through the water. So we got this amphibian, you know, technology capable of way faster than light speeds. And, but the way they get around that, they don't violate the light speeds. And so it reminded me of a riddle Einstein left us. He said, how can you go millions of times faster than the speed of light without breaking the speed of light and remain constant in Newtonian physics? And that thing has haunted me for years. And when I was 18, I figured it out. Um, there's an answer to the riddle. It, 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 they, I knew about this, and I remember, it was like 1968, I'm working on this. Uh, how do you cross from point A to point B on a paper? Uh, Milky Way Galaxy Andromeda. It's the speed of light 200 million years to get across this page. That's moving at 186,756 miles per second. And it still take you 200 million years to get across there. Right. So what you do, people think you fold it. Well, not really. You roll it like you do a doobie, I guess. I wouldn't know anything about that. <laughs> so anyway, you roll it in as the, like a burrito. Mm -hmm. And as the walls are touching each other, uh, in the center, where the filling would be is where the spacecraft sits. And the spacecraft reaches out on a point fixed in space, and it pulls that to it, wrapping around it. Now, on a linear plane, you only have to move about that much because you're jumping through the walls as they touch each other. And um, I coined the phrase back then, it's trans-dimensional jumping. Trans-dimensional jumping. Right. And this engine I have would allow you to do that. And so in real time, you travel about two minutes. You shut your engines off, and now you have traveled 200 million light years in two minutes, but you did it about three quarters light speed on this short linear distance. So you never broke the speed of light, but look how far, but you went millions of times further and faster than speed of light could do it. And what happens with time during that, David? It, it jumps with you. When you land where you're at, wherever you landed at, that's where your time is based at that point, uh, component. 
But I'll be the first to tell you, there's other things involved in this. I haven't got a clue. I don't even know how you're going to communicate or even navigate. First of all, you're out running your headlights. So how are you going to navigate or communicate? You tell somebody you're coming. Um, somebody's got to figure that out. I just can't seem to. What if you get there and that star's already out? Well, that's the other yeah, problem. You know what I mean? Yeah, this is why you got to communicate. You gotta, <laughs> anybody there? And, uh, <laughs> and also, Star Trek jumps around all this, you know, the, yeah. the lithium crystals. The best movie I ever saw to tell you how complicated this is was Interstellar. You know, for every five minutes you're standing over here, 70 years is passing here. Right. That's not going to fare too well from the place you just left. Because you might be out here for a few days and come back. You know, you've had a thousand years pass. A couple of thousand years pass. Yeah. By. So it's very difficult in stellar travel. Um, there's a way with you wrapping this, the barrier times. I would believe in there you're going to be able to break components where you can keep relative to your space and time. Really? Which that would help a lot. But I haven't had time to work on that. But I think the answer's there. But whoever these beings are that's traveling in this stuff, they've had to figure out a, a time consequence solution because they're going to run the same problems that uh, interstellar people did. Right. And there's still matter, the made of material. And so they're going to have to apply or bend to the same laws they, and rules. They're under the same 3D laws that yeah. we are. They have to be. i tell you something else about them. Everybody gives them too much, <laughs> you know, knowledge, you know, oh, they're, they're yeah. all-knowing, all-seeing, they'll come uh, here. I got news for you. They got Murphy's Law up there, but just as bad as we do. Yes, they do. They make mistakes. Things happen. You know, the biggest it, question I get is, if they're so smart, why do they get shot down? I said, when yeah. they enter our three-dimensional space, they fall under the laws of our 3D world. That's exactly right. And also, uh, yeah, I'm along the type, they spend all that time, money, send their best personnel here to run a probe up your kazoo? I don't think so. Nah. There's something else to all that. Yes, that's ridiculous. And, and, you know, it's just... We ain't got the real story. There's so much we don't know about what's going on. What other characteristics do these beings have? As he described it to me, um, it's fascinating stuff. Uh, the lower half, like from the the waist down, is like a fish. Yeah. Top half on up is is humanoid. And first thing I said, well, dang, there's your mermaids. You know, mermen, mermaids, and. Um, mm -hmm. Bill said, uh, yeah, they had webbing between their fingers. That was perfect. Uh, their bottom half was long and whispery. And we now know if you ever looked at the scuba fins of the day, they're, you know, three feet long. Right. So there's something to that. And I'm going, well, that's interesting. And then uh, this really got good here. I said, well, tell me about their skin. Because normal skin is not going to take... 24-7 submersion. Mm -mm. You're going to wrinkle, you're going to prune, you ain't going to look too good. And he said, yeah, their skin is different. And he said, um, uh, they don't have scales like reptiles. And they don't have scales like fish, except the scales that's on the belly of a fish. You ever, you know how fine they Very are? Very fine. You rake a knife going the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. Some people don't know about that, but that's how you scan a fish. Mm -hmm.